Hi, everyone. My name is Radhika Bhatt. I'm the Deputy Director of the Opportunity Project, which is a program that we are here to talk about today. We hope that you've been enjoying the various um, Open Data Week events, and I'll let my colleague Drew introduce herself as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Drew Zachary. Um, I lead our team, our bigger innovation team at the Census Bureau called Census Open Innovation Labs, and I'm one of the proud co-founders of the Opportunity Project. Awesome. Thank you. So to, during today's talk, we're really just going to talk more about the Opportunity Project and our work at the Census Bureau to describe how the work that we're doing is, use, is using open data and technology for good. Um, so I'll start with just a brief overview of our program, and then we'll also just dive into a lot of the outcomes and, and the different ways that open data is used in a variety of ways. So overall, the Opportunity Project is a program that brings together technologists, government, and communities to rapidly prototype digital products. And all of those products are powered by federal open data. And all of the products that are created are built to solve real world problems that are affecting people across the country. So the way that we've, we've done this work is that we really start with federal agencies. We work across the federal government and we work with federal agencies to target national challenges for data-driven innovation. So what that looks like is a really broad variety of problem statements that we've looked, on, looked at and worked on. So we've worked on things like ocean plastic pollution, air quality, economic self-sufficiency, as well as disaster response. And in particular, those were a lot of challenges that we worked on last year that were tied to natural and built environmental challenges. Again, also our, our program has been around for about five years now, five years now. So we've actually worked on even broader things like rural economic development, civics education, entrepreneurship, as well as health challenges like the opioid crisis and currently COVID-19. So the challenges that we work on are very, very far reaching and, and very broad. And there's no shortage of, of challenges, of course, that can be helped with open data. So the way that this, this process works is that tech teams sign up to tackle one or more challenges by building a digital solution in 12 weeks. So we assemble a coalition of experts during that time to support each tech team and accelerate their progress. And so there's four main roles that we include in this entire process. First, we have tech teams that are private sector companies, universities, and nonprofits, and students that participate in the sprints to actually build these products and use open data and translate the data into valuable tools. So the tech teams are responsible for driving the development of these products, and they also own the associated IP that comes out of the sprint as well. Additionally, we have a role called user advocates, and those are people that come from community organizations, they are community leaders, advocates, and people with direct lived experience in these challenges to make sure that the products that are created are actually built with end users in mind. We definitely care deeply about making sure that human-centered design is the center of this process. And so user advocates really help with that challenge itself. And we also have government involved. We have policy experts, we have data stewards from federal agencies, and they're responsible for making sure that data is being used, but also technologists can understand how to apply that data in different ways. And also policy experts help to the tech teams to understand from a high level view of how are these challenges kind of worked on from the government side and, and what is also needed from the community side. And then lastly, we have product advisors and those are folks that specifically help with things like product sustainability and go to market strategy as well. So as I mentioned, we operate this entire program through 12 week tech development sprint and each of those um, we have milestones that kind of structure the entire process. So we start with user research, which is making sure that the tech teams understand the challenges and the um, experiences of the communities on the ground. We also have data exploration, which allows teams to dive into the data itself. And then we also have two build demos where teams are building out their products and receiving feedback from all the different stakeholders to make sure that they're moving in the right direction. And then lastly, we have a public launch at Demo Day, which normally happens in December. And it's a public launch of all the products where teams can give lightning talks, connect more with different end users and communities that might uh, use their products. And it also, this last year, we did a three day long demo week where we had a lot of different types of workshops and interactive events to make sure that people were actually kind of getting use of, out of these products. 
And this is just a, a small snapshot of the different companies and groups that we've worked with. We do work with universities like Columbia and MIT, but we've also worked with a variety of, um, of smaller universities and, and smaller companies as well, in addition to big companies like Redfin and IBM as well. We do also work with startups. Um, that's something that we, we do pretty often as well. And one main thing that a lot of companies get out of this is the ability to further the work that they're already doing or even utilize this process to build something new that can support their business as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Drew to talk a little bit more about the details of some products that have been created and a little bit more about the outcomes and impact of the program. Thanks, Ravika. That I think can be a lot all at once to hear about the whole process and to really contextualize it will often turn to the examples of the products that resulted because that really brings it down to earth. You know, you're probably wondering, okay, so if I can wrap my head around this sprint process, what is the point of it all? Um, and some of the products that of the 130 products that have come out of our sprints, um, that's one of the ways that we really think about the impact of this program. And one of the reasons that we've been able to sustain it for so many years and continue to grow is because of the incredible work that's done by the teams that come through our process. So um, we definitely wanted to give a shout out to our amazing collaborators um, at Measure of America, which is a project of the Social Science Research Council. Um, I, in New York, <laughs> um, they have participated in possibly a record-breaking number of our sprints. I'm not sure if any of them have joined any of the sessions or on the line today, but um, they started building this product, data2go.nyc, which hopefully some of you have heard of and see on the screen here. I believe in our very first sprint back in 2016, and they ultimately came through a few different sprints um, to build out the product further. And what this does is puts, um, combines the amazing New York City open data sets um, on neighborhood indicators that are really important to people alongside data from the Census Bureau, um, Department of Labor, and many other different federal sources so that, you know, in a really beautiful UI and accessible mapping tool, people can zoom right into their neighborhood and see, um, you know, really important measures of things like crime and income and neighborhood resources and things that matter to them. Um, and they've also used this product in a really creative way to promote 2020 census um, response rates in New York City, which as we all know is incredibly important um, as it'll drive so many things about the next 10 years of life. Um, and they, they use the data to identify some of the most important stakeholders in a particular community and then communicate about the census in ways that were meaningful to them. So for example, if a particular neighborhood in Brooklyn had a really high population over 65, um, they could then target messaging about why it's important to respond to the 2020 census based on issues that that type of audience might care about. And actually, I should also say that Measure of America was one of the winners of our first ever prize competition that was run by our team at the Census Bureau. They won a $20,000 prize for their work. Another of the five prize winners was um, this team, which is a venture studio out of um, Citigroup. They built this awesome product called City Builder, um, really helping investors to understand the Opportunity Zone ecosystem. Um, and so if you're familiar, Opportunity Zones was a long-term tax incentive-based program to catalyze development in um, communities all across the country. There were thousands of census tracts that were considered to be Opportunity Zones. Um, but because it's a really particular type of investment um, and to ensure that, you know, this wasn't turning into just a program for gentrification, but that it really had communities and their needs at the heart um, of investment and that, you know, places that weren't as heavy in, you know, a population of investors, um, places, you know, outside of the, the coasts. Um, could really benefit from this city builder built this awesome tool that helps investors and fund managers to explore, um, you know, different opportunity zones and what their characteristics are, you know, to learn more about the community, what their needs are, economic indicators, growth patterns, and even to understand opportunity zones itself as a mechanism. So we were super excited about their work. They put, um, they made a really excellent use of federal open data from many different sources um, including as well as local data. Um, and like I said, they were one of our prize winners as well. The other thing that we often talk about is that by, I think people, you know, continue to have an unfortunate perception of federal government that 
um, you know, agencies are not very innovative and are, you know, kind of stodgy and used to working in a certain way that's maybe based in contracts um, with the private sector. And there's definitely an element of truth to that. But what we've seen through our sprints is that it really enables federal employees to learn um, how to be creative and, um, you know, how to use processes like human-centered des design and agile methodology um, and just learn how to be more collaborative with industry and with communities and um, not, you know, just become aware of different ways that they can have a constructive relationship with people who are trying to solve the same problems that are at the core of everyone's mission. So a really great example of that is um, FEMA. They led a problem statement in the Opportunity Project back in 2018, focused on helping people to prepare for disasters. Um, and What's great about the Opportunity Project is that we're not looking for just one solution. We really approach this as we would love to see three or four different, totally different and equally great and valuable solutions. Um, so there's no one winner except in our prize competitions where there are several winners, but in our sprints, it's a very um, collaborative process and open environment where teams can partner with one another. They can be going in different directions and learn from one another. And the public really value, uh, generates you know, value from that by seeing so many different tools that they can use. So in response to FEMA's challenge, um, you know, they came in really interested in games, but went through this process. They were super flexible and, you know, really learned how to recalibrate their expectations and just be open to different solutions. And three of the solutions that came out of that, I think, are such a great illustration of the diversity of ideas that come out of this process. So the first that I'll speak about on the next slide was a mapping tool that uses satellite data to predict infrastructure failure. The other was a digital game that it's like an iPad game that you can play that helps young people to learn preparedness actions for something like a flood, um, which, you know, if they live in a flood prone area, they may not know what the right preparedness actions are, say, if they're in a car. Um, but by using this iPad game, they're able to interactively learn what to do if that happens to them, which may be likely. Um, and then a, a couple of other different solutions as well that included like a participatory mapping technology and, and several other things. So um, on the next slide, this tool called SEAL that was built by a great collaborator called Datel Ovella. They're an Estonian American company. Um, it uses SAR data um, for folks who might be familiar. It's kind of satellite data that bounces off of the ground and um, gathers, it's able to detect like millimeter uh, size diff changes in elevation. Um, and so it could tell you over time, you know, when you put that together over time, you could look at a map like this and see, okay, well, this hot zone is where elevation is dangerously changing. And maybe that's a bridge or it's a, you know, housing community where because of the change in elevation, they can work with engineers to predict that that structure is very vulnerable to catastrophic failure in the event of a hurricane or um, severe winds or flooding or something. So in a place like Puerto Rico or even here in New York, um, where there is the potential for natural disasters, that's so valuable to be able to, you know, to take preparedness actions as a city or as a local government. Um, so they piloted this for Puerto Rico, and then they actually undertook a big project with New York, the city of New York and FEMA to um, to work on a preparedness plan in the event of an earthquake in New York City. So we're super excited to see that collaboration continue over the years. So there have been 130 plus products to date. And I think um, what has been so cool is that in our first sprint, um, we this was all kind of an experiment that if we make data available to the private sector and to creative people outside of government, um, those collaborators would build it, you know, many more tools than we ever could on our own as government or than we ever should attempt to. So maybe one government agency can make one mapping tool, but if we put the same data and challenges, problem statements out to um, the public, that people would generate so many different types of solutions. And that's really what we've seen play out over the years. In the first sprint, um, we had a lot of, you know, even the fact that 12 solutions came out of that first sprint was incredible. It was a lot of kind of mapping tools and locations of resources. And as we've grown over time, we've seen that expand to, um, you know, digital games like you see on the screen at the top here in the middle, um, kind of collaborative crowdsourcing tools like you see in the top right corner, AI algorithms, 
um, you know, a, you name it, any different type of product. And that has come through our process. So it's really exciting to see that continue to grow. And we hope that some of you will also get involved in the future to create new things. Awesome. Thanks so much, Drew. So the, this last section of what we're talking about today is a little bit more about what lessons we've learned through this process and also what resources are available for, um, for people inside the process, but also folks like you all that are maybe interested in learning or, or getting involved. So one thing that, um, that I wanna talk about is one of our resources, which is called the Data Curation Hub. I'll show that in a minute, but one thing that we've really learned through the five years of this program being around is that um, we really recognize the challenge that is posed for technologists trying to find the right open data and find the right application of it. So we've also seen that, you know, even if technologists find the data they're looking for, there oftentimes are a lot of questions around the data, you know, how to use it, what do different um, parts of the data mean, or is there an API available, like all those technical questions exist, but there oftentimes isn't a person that can speak to the details of that information. So we've noticed that. We've also seen that there's an absolute enormous amount of federal open data out there through data.gov, through other portals. But what's really missing is that connection between the federal open data and a theme or a topic that it can be applied to. So through our process, through interacting with different technologists, through getting their feedback on data, we've really understood these challenges and also asked the question of how might we better empower technologists with open data and help them find what they're looking for that is through something that's more accessible than this entire process. So what we've been able to create is something called the Data Curation Hub. And you can also explore that at opportunity.census.gov slash data. It is live and open to the public. So this platform specifically brings together all of the different federal open data sets that we curate in our sprints. And a lot of this data is from across the federal government. And as you can see on this slide, we've curated them based on different themes. So we have a workforce challenges theme that looks at opportunity zones, entrepreneurship, um, even career pathways. And it has data from um, the De uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, Department of Labor, Department of Commerce, SBA, a lot of different places. But we've also curated um, topics on the natural environment and built environment as well as an entire module on COVID-19 that includes a lot of census data as well as um, data on small businesses as well. So definitely feel free to explore that resource that is completely open to the public. And there are also um, individuals that you can connect with if you're interested in, um, if you have any questions about the data and things like that. So this is one resource that's kind of come out of our learnings through this entire process. Another one is uh, we also have two toolkits. And so Drew will talk a little bit about this first one called Topics. Thanks. So um, this whole process that we have been um, kind of incubating over the last five years uh, has become really detailed and, you know, very intentional set of milestones and the whole process really um, lives within our team. But we wanted to make that as widely accessible as possible so that, um, first of all, any agency within the federal government um, can just use it at will. Uh, we wanted to be able to make this process accessible. Actually, FEMA is a great example because they, unfortunately, our current um, sprint cycle falls during hurricane season. So it's always really hard for them to participate after that first year. So for agencies who have you know, a mission reason that it's hard for them to align with our timelines or who just want to be able to um, kind of customize what this process looks like for them. The TopX toolkit enables them to do that. It open sources everything about our process for any government agency to use. And the second thing is that it really documents this knowledge within federal government so that it's not dependent on one office or set of people. It's really just part of the way that federal government can do business in general that's open to any agency. Um, and to test that out, we partnered with the State Department uh, Office of Foreign Assistance last fall to um, to test this out and just pilot, you know, and, and learn more about how this works and test that it works 
on a sprint focused on reimagining civics education for the kind of new generation of learners who have a different way of consuming information that's much more digital, but still have just as much need to learn basic civics as, as any previous generation. So we saw great outcomes from that sprint. Um, great collaboration with state. And then this year, we're actually um, currently working on a, a second use with the Department of Health and Human Services, um, which I think was also partially discussed during, um, during our events at Open Data Week, but we would love to invite everyone to, con uh, to join in that effort since it's ongoing. And the focus is to help um, enable all of this, you know, massive volumes of COVID testing data for the many different types of stakeholders who need to consume it, whether that's state and local public health authorities, federal government, employers, people who have to get tested regularly will all need some type of data tools to help them manage that, especially as, um, as at home testing be, be kind of rolls out onto the market and becomes more frequent. So we're excited about that collaboration. And then I'll just say that the TopX toolkit, um, we, I highly encourage everyone to check it out on our website. It's super detailed, tailored to government agencies, again, very flexible and adaptable. It certainly could work at the local level as well. And I just wanna shout out also to our great colleagues at the Beck Center at Georgetown University who are currently working on a pilot of doing top specifically at the local level. So happy to answer questions about that as well. Awesome, thank you so much, Drew. So another toolkit that we have, as you heard that TopX toolkit is specifically for government agencies or even local and state government to run the top sprint. But we also have a product development toolkit that is also specifically for technologists that are interested in building something themselves. So the product development toolkits also on our website under the resources tab. And this really outlines the entire process from a product development point of view. So it really outlines the process in terms of forming a team, conducting user research, diving into the data, and it very much allows individuals or teams to kind of follow this human-centered design process on their own. Um, and so by utilizing this toolkit, you'd still be able to participate in the benefits of a top sprint by having access to the data and other stakeholders um, through this toolkit as well. So that's another opportunity if anyone is interested in using this process to build something, um, the product development toolkit is there for that as well. And so with all of that being said, you might be wondering how might I get involved or how might my group get involved? So we have a slide for that um, and I'll hand it over to Drew to talk a little bit about different ways of getting involved. Thanks. I hope everyone is wondering that and we would love to have you all get involved. There is really, um, like Radhika described the roles, there's really a role for everyone. So um, the first thing that I would love to encourage everyone to do is to get involved in our 2021 sprints. Um, and each year for the past three or four years, we've identified big themes at the beginning of the year. So in 2020, our focus was on the natural and built environment. We focused broadly on earth-related challenges. Prior to that, we worked on census, a census theme, um, a workforce theme, and several others. So for this year, our themes will focus on COVID economic recovery and climate and sustainability, um, as well as community engagement with 2020 census data, really focusing on helping communities to see themselves in the 2020 census data and really engage in, it, um, in ways that are meaningful for them. Um, so if you would like to, to join in that sprint in any capacity as a data steward, a tech team, you know, an interested kind of community advocate, uh, product expert, or anything else, um, follow the link at the bottom of this slide, and we can also drop that into the chat if you have it. And there's also sort of a team email if you have any specific questions, you can reach us there. Um, the second, again, is to use that product development toolkit. Um, the, of course, in addition to kind of the resources that are on that product, um, that will also make you eligible to apply for the Opportunity Project Prize Competition, which is opening later this year. So any team that either goes through a sprint with us or another federal agency that uses the top model, or if you do this on your own using the product development toolkit, you'll be eligible to apply um, for some funding. So we highly encourage that. And in general, we have workshops, events, um, you know, different ways of getting involved throughout the year. So we really encourage you to sign up for updates and we reach out really frequently just to make sure that um, everyone in the community knows about all the ways that we have to engage. Again, we're an open innovation team. So we are all about bringing as many people to the table as possible and hearing more perspectives. So um, yeah, thank you so much for, for joining and I'll turn it back over to Radhika. Yeah, thanks so much, Drew. So 
with that, um, we kind of just have time for q and A. I know that we've mentioned a lot. Um, so Eric, thank you for asking a question. Are the toolkits open to the public? Yes, they are. And I can drop both those links in a second. Yeah, and I'll also drop the link for the data curation hub. Drew, do you want to take um, some of the other questions? Sure. What type of roles are you looking for in this next sprint? I think, again, the slides that we can share and our website will be really helpful because it outlines the specific roles. But generally, I think there's sort of four categories. There's government and government, whether it's local, state, tribal, federal, uh, government officials help with the understanding the, the problem at like a national or local level, resources that are available, and the, the data sets. Public data is like a huge, obviously a huge part of this process, so we help to answer questions about government data. The second is tech. Um, so if you're in a civic tech organization, a tech company, a tech student at a university, anybody who could build a product, a digital product, um, that's a huge role in the sprint. Um, the third is what we would call a user advocate. And these are like, I think that's kind of our fancy term now for just saying anybody who's a stakeholder who might use these products. So if we're doing a sprint about, you know, veterans, and even if you're a veteran, that would be a great role in the sprint is just to share your experiences and help to define the problem um, from a grassroots level. But that could also be community organizations, teachers, advocates, nonprofits, um, anyone who can lend their expertise to a boots on the ground perspective. And then finally, we have product experts. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Radhika. So product experts are the ones who really... Um, help to ensure that these things get into people's hands and live on after the sprint um, because technology is, doesn't maintain itself. So every team needs to have a strategy to ensure whether that's open sourcing or a handoff or marketing or something to ensure that um, these become real living products. Radhika, do you wanna to speak to like, will, will we have meetings for those who are interested in getting involved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in terms of, um, you know, the process between now and starting the sprints, so we are going to have some more engagements with federal agencies, but also community groups to um, really just drum up excitement as we get closer to figuring out the different problem statements. So in terms of being able to join um, more meetings and like dive into the details of what participation looks like, we will be having those, um, I'd say in the next two months. We'll, we'll be sharing more information on that. So definitely um, sign up for the, on the Get Involved page, there's um, an ability to just like share your email with us so we can send you information. So definitely do that. And we'll be sending more information out shortly. And um, I think also another thing that we do is we do these different community engagement workshops that look like a lot of different things throughout the year. So we might be doing those during the sprints as well. So there's even flexible flexibility there if you can't join for an entire sprint, but you're interested in kind of connecting right at the beginning to share your expertise on a specific challenge, there's also an opportunity there. Awesome. And there were a couple of super specific questions. One thing I'll say is that about data questions, the Census Bureau has an open Slack workspace. Um, which if we might not be able to pull the link right now, but you sh it should be pretty easy to Google, um, or you can reach out to the email we provided if you have questions. That is a great place to ask hyper-specific data questions and people will answer them. <laughs> They're very good about that. And there's a huge community of thousands of people who are very in the weeds. So I would recommend that for your technical questions. If you have a question about how the Census Bureau in general is operating, um, send us an email and we'll make sure that that gets routed to the right person. Um, and then in terms of, I think there was a question about like, if I'm an individual and maybe have a limited skill set, how can I get involved? I will say just transparently, it's not, um, there are a lot of really great processes like our colleagues at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau have an open sprint process where um, it's only a week long and they do have many individuals get involved who can be placed on a team. So there, we could probably refer you to a lot of sprints where individuals, um, it's designed for individuals. For us, it's more so designed for teams. So we would be more than happy to try and plug you into the team, but it's a little bit tricky with our process. So if you are, you know, gaining your data science skills through a boot camp or an open source course or a formal course, um, I would highly encourage you to see if other people would want to team up with you. Um, but again, feel free to reach out to us and we could like discuss your specific scenario and see um, what would make sense. Mm -hmm. And agreed. Also, if you are, if you're, taking classes at something like General Assembly or like Flatiron School, like 
there's even potential to kind of engage other students and form a team from General Assembly or some from some group like that. Like we have had actually Code for America brigades um, participate as teams. So there are different ways to get involved, but I would generally say, as Drew mentioned, that it is more team-based rather than individual-based, but there's definitely some possibility there. Okay, there's actually a lot of questions now, so I'll just keep ticking through. Um, we do encourage teams, I'm not sure if we've answered this yet, we do encourage them to open source their applications um, when that makes sense. So especially if there is like a nonprofit or, you know, a larger company that's doing sort of a public good corporate social responsibility project, that might make sense for them to open source it. Or if something is more based in like the technical kind of code underlying something, if it's an algorithm or something like that for the public good, we would encourage them to open source. There's some occasions when a big company like Redfin, you know, is building a project product and maybe there are elements that they can open source, but they're of course like an existing private company. So they're not necessarily going to open source everything. So the answer is like, yes, um, if, and when that applies, but we also see teams have success with other strategies that um, keep their uh, material proprietary, like it's their IP, um, but they're able to open up the tool to as many people as possible while still retaining the IP themselves. Um, Radhika, there's a question around just like what, you know, how we think about the percentage of successful projects and how we're like measuring that and how many we would consider successful. Do you want to um, start off that one? Mm -hmm. Sure. So in terms of um, successful products, so we kind of keep track of which companies are kind of continuing development and continuing to work on their product. I'd say one way that we really um, keep track of that is specifically with our prize winners. So those, um, as Drew mentioned, in 2019, we ran our first prize uh, competition that gave 100K um, in funding across five teams. And each of those teams we've kept up with to say, you know, what has the funding helped you with? What is the continued number of users and how has the product kind of grown? So those are, um, those are a few products that we kind of keep a close eye on. But additionally, um, that's something that we're also working on to make sure that what are the different ways of tracking the impact around this? Because I think number of users only paints a certain picture and we want to make sure that we are capturing the actual impact of these products and how these products are actually helping to solve the challenges that are affecting people. So um, it's definitely kind of a work in progress, but we generally keep up with all of the participants that and the tech teams that build products to kind of hear how they are continuing their work and um, continuing to support the technology and, and different end users. And I'll just say, um, I just mentioned this in, in the chat in response to a specific question, but um, we for if people are interested in youth programming for youth like below that are kind of grade school age through high school, we would probably connect you with um, some of our collaborators either at Statistics in Schools, which is a program widely run by the Census Bureau or efforts like Let's Make a Count that are sort of dedicated to um, high school and younger. Uh, but if so that we would love to do that, please feel free to reach out to us. If you are focused on like university age students, we have a university sprint program that started last year. So um, we'll, we'll definitely be doing more with that this year. So again, I think it would be great for these kind of specific cases. Just reach out to us and we'll ensure that somebody gets back to you to um, figure out how we could plug you in. I see there was a question. I think Radhika may have covered this a little bit just now, but um, how do we determine what projects are chosen to be funded? So. Um, the vast majority of products that have come through our process are um, like there isn't funding involved in our sprints. So we kind of see the teams take a lot of benefit um, just from the process itself. And we can talk more about that if people have questions. But for the teams, so there's like a subset of teams that choose to apply for the prize. And the winners are um, in our 2019 competition, and again this year, will be evaluated by panels of experts. Um, we had more than 50 experts evaluating submissions in 2019, and they focus on five different categories or five different criteria that include a technical quality assessment, a sort of equity and community engagement assessment around, you know, to what extent human-centered design was applied and the end users of the, the product really had their perspectives represented, um, how effective was their use of open data, 
um, the potential for impact and other categories as well. So it's a pretty holistic assessment that reflects the principles of our program, which revolve around creative use of open data, human-centered design, um, and actually making an impact with the products. If anyone is interested in getting involved in a specific sprint on a specific topic or even have any suggestions for us, um, please do fill out the form that I just dropped. It actually has a comment and question section at the bottom. So we can definitely address your specific question there as well if you want to continue the conversation with us. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for attending this Friday session with us. Thank you for your questions and thank you for your engagement in general. Again, please do reach out to us. Our email is also right on this slide, but if you um, fill out this form, we can also make sure that we're sending you up-to-date information on ways to get involved. So thank you so much. Oh, Rebecca, I think it looks like you have a quick question. Feel free to ask. Students can get involved in top sprints. So what we've done in the past, last year actually we ran an entire university-focused sprint in the fall, and it was very much aligned with um, different curriculum and specific classes at universities. So that worked really well. We also had, you know, the buy-in of professors there to help their students continue through the process and um, kind of apply the skills that they're learning in school to the sprint. So students are definitely welcome to get involved. We have found it to be effective um, if we have specific university programs or even um, courses participate in the sprint. So if that's something you're interested in, please certainly fill out the form and we can and mention that you're interested in that and we can follow up with you. Um, yeah, just to echo that, I feel free to just, if you know, drop a question into the, the form. If you're specifically interested in students and you're not seeing a way to indicate that, you could just drop a question or comment at the end and we'll make sure that you get information. Um, and I will also say within the next week or two, we'll be releasing our annual report from 2020. Um, and that includes a lot of information about um, the recent university sprint and ways to get involved. Again, if you're focused more on high school students, we don't have a specific program for that within the Opportunity Project, but we'd love to discuss that with you. And we can also connect you up with some of our colleagues um, who do run high school and younger focused programs. Thank you all for joining. Thanks for joining. Thanks, everyone.